Hey guys, Jason here with another Tag Team Duel Masters deck profile. Today's deck is going to be on another internet favorite featuring Marino Mancer. Now, I have a love-hate relationship with this deck. You know, I really love Marino Mancer as a card. I think it's very cool conceptually, but the whole building process was a nightmare for us. The thing about Marino Mancer was that we found it was very easy to build a deck around it that could handily beat control or easily beat aggro, but not both. We found it was very hard to give Marino Mancer a very competitive matchup spread. And so the deck we have today is one we're very proud of because we think it's one that accomplishes that. So Marino Mancer, when he hits the field, you basically draw two or three cards. Actually, no, you get some. You get all the light and darkness cards and put them in your hand. But really, if you're building the deck right, and if you're not super unlucky, that's what should be happening. Yeah, hitting hitting three cards off of Marino Mancer is pretty insane, given given his um cost and yeah, and he's a creature himself as well. So. So starting off the list, we have arguably the best card in the deck, Sarius Vizier of Suppression. Now, I'm only half memeing when I say this is the best card in the deck, because really, two drops are great. I love two drops, um, especially against aggro. You know, they help you not get overwhelmed and lose in the first five turns. And he's also a great bait for Craze Valkyrie the Drastic. Now, this is an addition that Andrew and I have long <laughs> talked about, and this is one that Andrew is quite proud of, two Ballas Vizier of Electrons. Is this because you think four copies of uh, Ceres is not enough? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, because the thing is with this deck is that when you're not running enough two drops, or actually most decks in general, I feel like if you go second, you're behind by quite a lot at yes. least in aggressive yeah. matchups. So what we did was, well, we were like, okay, if Sarius is the best card, let's see if we can run more copies of the, <laughs> air quotes, best card. Yeah. So two copies of Ballas act like more copies of Sarius. So again, cheap Evo bait and another attacker. And only 50% meme. Yeah, it's only 50% <laughs> meme. Also, like, doing some quick maths, six two drops means we should be seeing one every seven cards, so right on curve, especially if we're going second. Mm. Yep. Now, controversially, and the reason we were able to make space for two ballasts, we are only running two copies of Taj Mahal. I think people are going to get pretty mad about this. But because <laughs> this deck has no mana acceleration, we need to charge cards every turn. And honestly, I kept getting mana screwed by multi-sieve, so <laughs> Taj Mahal had to get some cuts. To be honest, he's kind of better as a dual color source than like <laughs> as a card on the field sometimes. But... Yeah, I don't know. We we just couldn't cut him entirely. Sometimes I feel like we should run more, but every time we <laughs> we put in another one, I'm like, ah, touch him all. So he's just there at, the, at two. Yeah, he's um he's good against. Well, it depends on like what matchup you're playing. He's really good against some and terrible against others. So yeah, it really depends on um what you're playing against. Yeah, aside from the usual blocker hate, uh, f getting coriled, um, it feels especially bad because a lot of the times if you get a vanilla coriled, then you can just chuck it into mana or something. Yeah. And then with Taj Mahal, you just <laughs> can't do anything with that. Yeah, and if you're looking, like, if the main purpose of having Taj Mahal is just evolution into um, Craze Valkyrie, then these serve the same pr uh, purpose, except yeah. they're mana cheaper. Yeah. Right, now, a card we thought really made the deck click was... Three copies of Aqua Hulkus, or, you know, Hulkus Aquatico. <laughs> now, Aqua Hulkus, well, in the past, we were actually running Energy Stream, just because that seemed to be what made sense at the time. But no, um, because this deck doesn't have fire, it doesn't have many efficient ways to deal with a board of creatures, you need more creatures to police the field. And, you know, the way light does kill creatures is by tap kill. And so another body on the board makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. The fourth Aqua Hulkus was a difficult cut to make. Uh, sometimes uh, you run into this dynamic where four feels like too much, but three doesn't feel like enough. But because of we have enough early drops in the deck and, you know, they all happen to be bodies, uh, we felt that we could get away with just running three. Mm. And also don't forget that Aqua Hulkus is also water, so it runs into problems with Merino Mansa as well. So you don't want too many copies. Yeah. Now another card we're running, three copies of Magris Vizier of Magnetism. This is our other evil bait. I think Magris is a pretty good card for the deck, but three is just the right number for it. I think if you run four, you'll run into him more often than you would like. And, you know, another reason we don't run four is because he is a little slow. Mm. 
Three is the new four. Three is the new four. <laughs> All right, now uh, the other four drop we are running, four copies of Cranium Clamp. That's right, we are playing Clamp Masters. Andrew, I want you to talk about this card. <laughs> well, you know, uh, our motto is uh, you play Cranium Clamp <laughs> wherever you can, wherever you can. <laughs> as often as you can. <laughs> as often, <yeah. laughs> And, um, mm. But no, Cranium Clamp is just really good against basically all, all matchups, um, against ag aggressive decks. You know, often when you Cranium Clamp them on turn 4, it's like a lost soul. Because they don't have any, any cards in their hand anyway by, um, by turn 4. And then against Control, even if, you know, we, we've, we've kind of developed this meta where the other players started to just keep their cards in their hand <laughs> <laughs> as a way to counter Cranium Clamp. Clamp proofing as we yeah, call clamp it. Proofing. Um, but you can just clamp in the game. <laughs> <laughs> now we move on to the star of the deck as we progress through the curve for copies of Marino Mancer. So this guy is great for drawing cards because who doesn't love to draw cards? Marino Mancer curves into our threats, he curves into our creatures, and to be honest, because we don't have mana acceleration, he also curves into good for mana charges. <laughs> Uh, we thought about swapping out the fourth Marino for the fourth Aquahulkus to stabilize the early game, but Marino Mancer seems to be more of a high-impact card, and to be honest, we have enough cards to stabilize our early game, since again, we've got like 11, and they're all creatures. Mm, yes. Now, a new addition to the deck that makes it kind of crazy, we've got three copies of Petrova, Channeler of Sons. So this is a card that really, we are paying homage to the old OCG lists that had Aquan. I think they really liked playing Petrova Initiates, and I thought it was a really cool concept, and I'm glad we were able to bring it over. Now, we found that Merino is what you often want to be playing on 5, but you're not always going to get Merino on 5, and therefore we needed another strong 5 drop that could really swing momentum in our favor. So Petrova's great for that. Uh, you know, usual applications, buffs your initiates, makes them very hard to deal with, and it's a nightmare for control to deal with as well, just because, you know, there aren't there aren't many viable cards in the game that deal with Petrova properly. So yeah. Petrova's quite good. Uh, we found that Petrova could really make or break certain matchups. Like sometimes um, when we see Petrova, it's like, okay, I can I can run away with this against stuff like Twin Cannons, very good, because, you know, this guy <laughs> trades unreasonably favorably. <laughs> with Twin Cannon. With Twin Cannon. And our meta game also has a lot of medium-sized evolution threats, stuff like Hydru's, Spin Slicer, and Bark Whip, that this deck has no way of dealing with until turn 6, unless they break Terrapit. So Petrova can really be a lifesaver and swing the matchup in our favor, or swing the game in our favor anyway. And also, don't forget, you can also call liquid people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because Taj Mahal and Alcoholcus. Yeah, we've got five liquid people on board. <laughs> A very funny interaction with Petrova as well is if you Cranium Clamp on four and you happen to hit T-Dad and your opponent drops the T-Dad, <laughs> you could actually Petrova the following turn and then trade or kill with yeah. one of these guys. Now, another one of the threats we're running is Bloom... What is Bloom? What is Bloom's name? Bloom Urcus. Bloom Urcus, Flare Guardian. Okay, I've been looking at the Japanese <laughs> part for so long, I forgot what the English name was. So this guy, when he swings, you know, you activate your opponent's shield trigger spells. Great for playing around Holy Awe, Terra Pit, that sort of stuff. Playing against the Emperor's Gambit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, playing against the Emperor's Gambit, for sure. Uh, Bloom is just a really strong card. For a while, we were playing around without Bloom, just because I thought he was a very clumsy card. You know, he comes out on six, he can be targeted, um, he just dies. Mm. But then one thing that we found about Bloom is that he's actually not as fragile or as vulnerable as we once thought, because a lot of the rub pseudo-unconditional spot removal stuff, like Apocalypse, Vice, and Baz Gazeel, doesn't work on him. Mm. A lot of the time, Apoc and Baz seem like they're unconditional because everything just happens to be smaller than their power thresholds. But Bloom escapes that, meaning control decks really only have uh, Coral and Terrapit, maybe Aqua Surfer, to out him. Yeah. Yeah, and if you also think about, like, the, the playstyle of the deck, um, you're playing creatures all the time, so your opponent will still have to deal with your other creatures, and they might not even, you know, have the the mana or have the the card necessary to deal with Bloom when he comes out. Yes, very true. 
And for the last of Marino's triple threats, we have, of course, three copies of Craze Valkyrie the Drastic. Damien wanted to play four copies, but unfortunately we had to cut down to three. You know, playing YOLO Craze Valkyrie is fun, but we gotta, <laughs> we gotta make some difficult decisions. Really, I think three is fine. I think three is, is just enough. We've got a lot of Evo bait for him. We've got a lot of cheap Evo bait for him. So, you know, when he hits the field, just grab control of the board. Moving on to the Trigs, we play four Holy Aw, so this is kind of why we can get away with only playing three Craze Valkyrie. Holy Aw is just a really clutch card for the deck sometimes. When other decks are building boards, you just need Holy Aw to, to break them down. Sometimes Craze Valkyrie's tap two isn't enough because your opponent has a blocker, so they're able to stop you from killing your desired target. More importantly, this deck doesn't have too many shield triggers, so Holy Aw helps a lot. You know, play four to maximize the chances of it being in our shields. Another trick we're playing, four copies of Terrapit. This is our only true spot removal in the deck. Again, it's a really powerful shield trigger. A lot of the decks we're running actually cut down to three Terrapits because they could get away with running three because of all this destruction that they had. However, this deck I don't think can afford to cut down to three Terrapits. Mm. And the last two slots are, unsurprisingly, going to two copies of Lost Soul. Okay, maybe it is surprising because we don't have any ways to ramp to this card. But I think, actually, we thought that Lost Soul was too important to forget about in this deck. Now, our opponent oftentimes might get distracted by our big board of creatures or our big guys to deal with our hand in Lost Soul as first. So even if we aren't able to, to um, ramp to the requisite mana for Lost Soul. Um, we can still hit it before the opponent hits it. Uh, it's also just really good to top deck uh, late game uh, if we're able to charge to seven mana and hit the opponent with a Lost Soul. And it's another black color source which we can charge for Cranium Clamp early on. Mm, yeah, that is actually quite quite an important point because um, you do want to play Cranium Clamp on four and, and if you take a look, there's not too many darkness in, in the deck. Yeah. Lost Soul is a good to have, uh, that's probably how I would describe it. It's not really a um, live and die by card like it is for most traditional control decks, because to be honest, this isn't really a control deck. I describe this as a quasi control deck, kind of acts like a control deck, but really it's not. So the way this deck works is against aggro, you know, you just want to play it as controlly as you can, build up your field of cards to police the opponent, and then Cranium Clamp to rip cards out of their hand, and then if you're able to survive, he can grab momentum with Petrova or Craze Valkyrie. Against control decks, you kind of want to play a calculated beatdown style approach. Uh, one thing Andrew used to do is we were experimenting with three Ballas's, and then for Hulkus, we would just play it as um, Ballas, Hulkus, Rush, mm -hmm. and then if they don't have Triggs, then they kind of lose. But uh, since we've made adjustments to the deck, um, that isn't as consistent. I think against control, you probably want to build up a decently sized board of creatures and then have Petrova lead the charge, or this guy. Yeah, against control, you really just want to overwhelm your opponent with creatures as, as best as you can before they start taking taking over with their destruction and, and, and uh, cards like Cranium Clamp as well. Yeah, and, and to be honest, another reason Petrova was a very good fit for the deck is the Light Civilization is actually a very good civilization, if not the best, for saying, okay, I'm going to build a big board of creatures, deal with me. And that's kind of what this deck aims to do against Control anyway. And before we wrap up, some of the cards we considered, we considered Corpse Charger, but that was just too situational. Um, we played around with some Eureka Charger builds with Miraculous Plague. Perhaps that concept could come back, but in a different deck. Didn't really suit this one too well. And we also thought about Locomotiver. I think if you really wanted to play Locomotiver, you could bump up your shield trigger count by cutting maybe one Terrapit, one Holio, and one Cranium Clamp. But our preference is to just, you know, play 4-4 four, four, and 4. So that's the deck. I hope you guys liked it, and I am very glad to be finally done with this. I'm sure Damien and Andrew are as relieved as I am. Again, you know, it's a deck with a decent matchup against both aggro and control, and it's why we are really happy with this. Yeah, it's um, it's one of those decks that you, it seems like it's really simple. Um, like, the concept is, is quite simple, but in theory, like, when you play against different decks, it just doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> in practice, in yeah. practice, yeah. Play against the friendly. Um, yeah, so we've um, spent probably close to a year, yeah, <laughs> trying to figure out how to 
fist making. I think we finally, finally did it. Yeah. Super swag.